D.C. office. Uh, my prime responsibility is working on issues of free expression, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm out on campus today. Uh, we have gathered together a group of the world's leading uh, experts on circumvention technology and helping people to express themselves and access information around the world. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I will skip the long and boring lecture about why free expression uh, is important to our company. It's something that I think everybody here shares as a principle and as a goal. And despite its complexity, something that we work for every day. Instead, I'm going to get right to our guest who knows more about uh, this world than uh, so many people out there and uh, is a real star of the field. Uh, professor Ron Debert is Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk Center for International Studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, there are other people from the Citizen Lab with us today as well. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary, I can say that three times quickly, uh, research and development hothouse that works at the intersection of the internet, global security, and human rights. Uh, the initiative is really known for combining uh, the discipline of technology with the goals and the principles of trying to help people uh, not only undertake uh, research and engage in advanced development of tools, but also in helping people who otherwise would have their voices stilled around the world. Uh, Ron is also a co-founder and, and a principal investigator of what's called the Open Net Initiative, which is a research and advocacy project that examines internet censorship and surveillance worldwide. Uh, I, I recommend them very highly if you're interested in what is being censored where in the world. They do a, a brilliant map uh, that shows the difference between political and cultural and the overlapping areas of censorship around the world. Uh, in 2002, he was awarded the University of Toronto's Outstanding Teaching Award and the Northrop Frye Distinguished Teaching and Research Award and was a Ford Foundation Research Scholar of Information Communication Technologies from 2002 to 2004. Uh, in the amusing uh, category, he was named to the Maclean's Magazine Honor Roll as one of 39 Canadians to have helped make the world a better place in 2006. And uh, get this, to Esquire Magazine's best and brightest list of, uh, in the year 2007. Uh, without further ado, Ron Diebert. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, and uh, to Google for hosting us uh, here. It's uh, really a great opportunity to bring together a lot of people who have been working on this over the years, and it's uh, also great to see uh, Citizen Lab alumnus Michelle Levesque in the back of the room here at Google. So uh, a great time all around. Um, as we gather here, I just want to begin my presentation. Several thousands of miles away, events are unfolding in Iran that really have relevance to our workshop. Uh, an election is occurring and a social movement is again mobilizing on the streets of Iranian cities and connecting through <coughs> networks of support to cities across Europe and North America. Uh, in Toronto, a very dynamic group of Iranians have banded together in support of activists on the ground. Um, and uh, this is probably happening in, in cities here in California as well. Now the role of technology in fairs such as these is often overstated. Uh, the battle is about much more than the latest social networking tool, no matter what label is assigned to the latest uh, revolution. But it should not be underestimated either. Cyberspace is the domain through which the contest of ideas takes place today and is heavily contested domain by parties on all sides of this conflict. It is widely known that demonstrators can achieve wider support and publicity through the use of cyberspace and mobile technologies, but the Iranian authorities are taking active countermeasures aimed at controlling the spaces for online resistance and dissent, and not just by censoring access to websites. They're employing more offensive actions as well. Uh, the internet has slowed down in many cities across Iran, and there are there have been periods where it's not accessible at all. It is essentially ground to a halt, similar to what happened in previous periods in uh, places like Burma. Uh, the AFP is quoting technicians as saying uh, that they have been ordered to uh, restrict internet service in this way, uh, rather than being some kind of technical problem. Uh, SMS messaging and mobile phone communications have also been suspended and jammed, and cyber 
organizers, dissidents, and activists have been targeted and arrested, uh, not just inside the country, but outside as well. And this is interesting that uh, there are reports of Iranian authorities monitoring social networking platforms, identifying people in Canada, United States, and Europe, uh, and harassing them, threatening uh, their family members who still uh, live in Iran. Of course, circumvention technologies, the topic of the discussion here today, uh, are, are actively being deployed in this, in this uh, conflict. Um, in our case, uh, with Siphon, right to no nodes are being mobilized, and we have uh, lots of interesting stories to tell about our experiences there. We're eager to hear about other projects as well. Uh, many of these projects have funding from U.S. government sources, which adds an interesting geopolitical twist to not only the cyber conflict, but to the role of circumvention technologies. More broadly, what is happening now in Iran offers a clear example of the new generation of controls that are being exercised in cyberspace as the domain becomes more heavily contested and is seen as a critical vector for the exercise of power. Rather than first generation controls as exemplified by China's great firewall, uh, we are seeing instead the emergence of what we call second and third generation methods that are more subtle, flexible, sometimes offensive in nature, designed to go beyond mere denial uh, to shape and limit the room for expression online. So in my talk today, I'm going to offer an overview of these trends in cyberspace controls, and I'm going to be doing it through the lens of uh, the Open Net Initiative, which is one of the projects that I helped uh, found and, and still uh, uh, help to, uh, to oversee and run. Um, I do this not because the ONI is a, is a world leader in documenting these methods, but because the new forms of control I describe present a challenge to the ONI's own methods. Um, and the challenges to the ONI's methods that these new controls present are analogous to the challenges that I think are, are uh, present themselves to the circumvention technology community. And so I talk a bit at the end of my presentation uh, about uh, those challenges for circumvention that I hope we'll pick up today in this workshop. Let me begin with a description of the ONI. Uh, when it was formed, it was a uh, three university collaboration uh, uh, with four principal investigators and founders. Uh, my colleague Rafael Rojozinski, uh, who is the host of this event here, uh, at the time was at the University of Cambridge. He had started something called the Advanced Network Research Group, um, and it was one of the original founding partners. Also uh, involved uh, are my colleagues from the Berkman Center at uh, Harvard University, John Palfrey and Jonathan Zittrain. And at one time, uh, there was a kind of functional division of labor here. Uh, the Citizen Lab was the primary uh, base for a lot of the technical development and the technical analysis and the development of tools. Uh, Harvard was the place where a lot of the organization takes place and a lot of the uh, open source information gathering was, was implemented. And uh, Cambridge, under Rafal's direction, was responsible for a lot of the deep field research and managing our network of field researchers that I'll talk about. Um, in fact, the project has its beginnings even earlier with uh, some student projects. And one of the, at that time, a student, Nart Villeneuve, uh, who's here joining us today, uh, along with Ben Edelman at Harvard University, were both working in similar areas. Uh, uh, trying to undertake technical interrogation of the internet to find out what content was being blocked by countries around the world. This was the problem that we were attempting to address. Now this functional d division of labor has changed over time. Partners have come and go. As it stands right now, uh, Cambridge, uh, Rafal has moved from Cambridge, really rests on the two universities at, at Toronto and Harvard. But we have a variety of partners and projects that have in one way or another either spun out or have some connection or network relationship uh, to the Open Net Initiative, and that includes our sister project, the Information Warfare Monitor, uh, the SecDev group, SecDev Cyber, which uh, Rafal uh, runs and Greg Walton and Nart uh, work for, Siphon is a circumvention tool, uh, again that has its origins with uh, Michelle Levesque and Nart, uh, is now a private company. Um, and, uh, 
I, I, I'd also point out OpenNet Asia, which is a regional network of about 16 uh, organizations across Asia, as well as EPIN, the Eurasian iPolicy uh, Information Network, which involves networks throughout Central Asia. So the Open Net Initiative, although it rests with these two universities, is really a broad um, umbrella of projects and organizations uh, that span uh, really all regions uh, of the globe. Uh, now the mission of the ONI is to document patterns of internet censorship. Uh, worldwide. And when we started the project, the problem we were confronting was this issue of, of there'd be reports of websites being inaccessible or filtered or blocked or censored. And there was no way to confirm or verify whether this was the case or not. And we wanted to bring some, some rigor to this project, to, to bring some uh, empirical methodology uh, to it so that we could provide an independent authoritative basis from which, say, advocacy groups who are interested in this area could point to. And I, I think we've done a fairly uh, good job of that. And at the core of the Open Net, Net, Net Initiative is a methodology that I think is quite unique for the social sciences. And it informs, I think, all of the projects that we do at the Citizen Lab. We call it a fusion methodology, which is a combination of technical interrogation methods, which I'll talk about a bit more in some detail. And these often get the most at attention when people are looking at the Open Net Initiative is a combination of technical interrogation and field research that is undertaken by actual human beings who live in the countries that we're interested in. And although the technical side gets a lot of the glory, I think the most valuable component of the methodology of the Open Net Initiative is the fact that we have this capacity of people uh, who live within, uh, within the countries that we're investigating, who target our technical tests, help us uh, understand the context, the social, the political context within which uh, our investigations are undertaken, help us understand what is happening in their country so that we can get a better idea of, of what's going on. As I mentioned, with OpenNet Asia, we have 15 partner organizations that are part of our wide umbrella. And the data from both of these sources is combined uh, using multidisciplinary analysis. We're not primarily technical people, although there are some very bright technical people who are part of uh, the Open Net Initiative. We're social scientists, we're lawyers, uh, we're sociologists, uh, political scientists, um, people who understand the context of the countries that we're investigating, and I think that's really a, a critical dimension of what we do. In terms of the technical side, uh, on one level, it's really quite simple. What we've done is we've created <clears throat> a, a, a set of software tools uh, that are deployed in countries that are under investigation that give us a snapshot of what's being filtered. Uh, not comprehensively. We don't have access to large data sets like what was described by the Google engineers. So instead, we have to be much more targeted and selective. And what we've done is we've created a database that we've maintained over the years now where we have baskets of content. And there are two large baskets, meta-baskets, you might say, of content. We call a global list and local list. And when the, within each of these baskets are thousands of categorized URLs, keywords, and domains. In the global list uh, are domains that we test in all countries. This is a, provides us with a basis of comparison of, of, of content that is being targeted for filtering. And it's, you know, human rights organizations, news sites, pornography. Uh, there's probably about 20 different categories of content in the global basket. In the local baskets are, are content uh, URLs and domains and keywords that are unique to each country. Uh, and these are usually in local languages. Uh, they're either uh, based on reports that we get about filtering that might be taking place in a, in a country. We want to confirm whether that's happening. Uh, or they're put together by our in-field researchers who understand that you know, this website of this particular opposition group uh, might be targeted at any one time. So the, the, what happens is uh, people who are in the country or are traveling to the country take our software, uh, it connects back to databases in, in Toronto, um, and it essentially automates the process of checking for accessibility to this content. 
Uh, it does so both locally and then with a control uh, server in Toronto. And we do a basic comparison, we run some further tests to try to identify at what level the content is being filtered, what methods are being used, is it an IP block, keyword block, a URL path, a domain that's being filtered, uh, is there some commercial filtering product being employed. So we run a variety of metrics that allow us to get some sense of the techniques that are employed in filtering uh, around the world. Um, now I think we have a, a, a pretty impressive list. I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish over the last several years. We started out by doing uh, country reports, so focusing on individual countries one at a time, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran and so on. Uh, we, we've issued several internet watch reports and bulletins and advisories. Around 2006 we were fortunate to receive funding from the MacArthur Foundation which allowed us to ramp up a global comparative survey uh, beginning first with around 56 countries all simultaneously done and in the last round we tested in close to 70 countries. Um, we've produced two books now uh, on the topic that report on these findings and provide some uh, theoretical overviews and analytical overviews of, of what we found beginning with access denied and then more recently uh, access controlled which some of you uh, may have heard of that was uh, the subject of controversy at the recent Internet Governance Forum. I can talk more about that. The Chinese delegation did not like that image uh, appearing outside of the room in which we were announcing uh, the book because it contained a reference to the Great Firewall of China. <clears throat> um, now what about the broad findings here? I'm just going to quickly summarize some of the main trends without getting into details before getting into these new generation of controls. So based on what the ONI has been looking at, based on what our methodology is oriented to find, here is what I can tell you. First of all, I would say that <clears throat> even though we haven't been testing the same number of countries over time, and we haven't been using exactly the same data, we're not looking for the same thing each time, I can say confidently that internet censorship is growing worldwide. Uh, when, we were started, when we started out, there were really only a handful of countries engaged in internet censorship. Uh, now they're, in the latest round, there are close to 40 that have some content filtering going on within their borders. Um, <clears throat> The vast majority, majority of content that is targeted for filtering is local language content. So um, that may be contrary to conventional wisdom. You think that you know, within a country they're more concerned about people accessing foreign news and foreign information. Well, although that happens, disproportionately most countries target the content that matters closest to home. So they focus on local language content. In China it's Chinese content. Uh, in Iran, it's Farsi content. And that makes sense. You want to limit and contain what citizens in your borders have access to that matters most to your local political situation. Most of the countries uh, that engage in internet censorship do so with very little transparency and accountability. And we heard some of, some about some of that this morning uh, with respect to China. Um, but it's, it's, I would say, the majority of the countries that do this don't do it with a, a large degree of accountability. Um, some countries yield block pages that say the content is forbidden. Uh, that's the most transparency you'll get. Uh, most of them do not talk openly about it. They don't discuss what type of content they target for filtering. So we're doing a lot of unearthing of what goes on beneath the surface. I would say also that this lack of transparency and accountability is multiplied by the fact that many countries use commercial filtering products to do the job of censorship. And the reason that I say that this m multiplies the lack of accountability and transparency is because the block lists that are used to do the filtering are considered trade secret, they're con considered proprietary. So researchers like us at the ONI, we can't examine those block lists to see whether there's any filtering errors or, or uh, category errors that may prejudice the, the filtering that's going on. <clears throat> and in our research we've been able to identify the use of products like Fortinet, WebSense, SmartFilter, most of these are California based companies that are used to uh, essentially violate basic human rights in places like Burma, Yemen, Iran and Tunisia. And of course this has now become a subject of considerable public policy debate in the United States about whether these companies should be permitted uh, to provide services uh, to countries that do that sort of thing. And we're of course following that closely. Um, some other basic findings, um, 
you know, there are about seven or eight countries that we would categorize as pervasive filters of internet content. And by that, we mean that they filter in every category of content that we measure for. So it's political content, uh, conflict, internet tools, cultural content. There are about seven of them. And then there are a lot more countries that selectively filter one content category, say pornography, for example. Or maybe it's a country like South Korea that blocks uh, uh, a lot of content relating to North Korea. Some other things we found. Mission creep, we call it. Um, this is where countries, once they put in place internet filtering for whatever reason, even if it's to deal with something that, that seems maybe plausible and legitimate, maybe some form of hate speech or extremism or, or whatever, or pornography, uh, once the tools are in place, it's very tempting to use them to deal with other troubling public policy issues. Uh, so for example, in Pakistan, where uh, Shazad here uh, will be speaking about the Pakistan situation later today, uh, filtering that started off by, by ostensibly blocking uh, imagery containing cartoons that was offensive has now broadened to include uh, independence and insurgency movements like the Baluchistan Liberation Movement. Uh, a lot of countries target, instead of content, the services and platforms uh, that, that are used by people, especially Web 2.0 type platforms. And there's a lot of collateral and upstream filtering. Uh, Rafael actually is the one who coined the term upstream filtering and for many years was prodding people at the ONI. Uh, this is an issue we need to look at more closely and, and now of course uh, we realize that he was very farsighted about that because there have been several incidences where countries are getting their service from uh, other countries upstream where filtering affects them. A good example is the blocking of YouTube in Turkey that was described earlier today affect users in Georgia because the Georgian ISPs got their uh, service from a telecoms company in Turkey. And that's uh, common in, in a number of other countries as well. As Bob said, you can go to our site and you can get these maps that uh, are clickable and take you into deep dives for each of the countries uh, and we categorize uh, them in different ways to give you kind of slices of which countries block what content. Um, you'll see that the number of countries increases uh, quite substantially when you look at social content. And that's because there is really now a driving force coming from the advanced uh, liberal industrialized countries, western countries, whatever you want to call them, uh, who are now implementing filtering for pornography or hate speech uh, in Europe, Canada, North America, Australia, and so on. And this is, uh, I believe, uh, kind of creating a, a, a normative terrain here that is making it acceptable to implement content filtering or impose requirements on internet service providers, uh, which gives legitimacy to other countries who are doing it for quite different reasons, which needs to be discussed. Now, I mentioned that the, the next generation controls that we see emerging <clears throat> that I'm going to talk about uh, have presented a challenge to the ONI, and I believe really the ONI is in the middle of a kind of, uh, for those of you who follow philosophy of science, Thomas Kuhn has this notion of, of uh, anomalies and how these uh, anomalies can create challenges to accepted paradigms and you have paradigmatic revolutions take place in the time of anomalies. And I, I feel we're very much in the ONI in one of these stages. And, over the last several years, uh, uh, and again, I would single out Rafal actually has, uh, has been really critical in pointing out those areas where there are gaps in how we go about doing what we do. Um, for example, blocking events that were occurring outside of the ONI testing window that we were missing. Uh, when we test with the ONI, we aim to test on every major ISP in a country in at least two f in two rounds for every phase of testing, but it's really only a snapshot. It's like going in and taking a picture and then leaving, right? Meanwhile, a major demonstration or an election would occur. The ONI testing is not going on. We don't know uh, what's happening during that period. We're also, of course, missing a lot of contextual factors that um, may reflect our concentration on technical interrogation. This is something I advise uh, the engineers at Google who are looking into reasons why blocking is occurring and so on, just reiterating what was said earlier, that contextual factors are very important to understand, that, that, that can inculcate a climate of self-censorship where intimidation factors in um, and threats and, and uh, informal requests and those sorts of things that happen that aren't uh, always picked up. And a number of other things as well. 
the big uh, event for me personally and for many of us was uh, in, when we were monitoring for internet censorship in Kyrgyzstan in 2005. And Kyrgyzstan, uh, a country at that time, very little, if any, internet filtering to speak of. Uh, but we happened to be testing in that country during the time of elections. And opposition newspapers, uh, their websites came under denial of service attack. And, and the owners of those, the operators of those websites came to us because they knew we were testing in the country. And they said, can you help us? You know, we're, we're being blasted and can you analyze what's going on? So we actually uh, had their content hosted in Toronto and analyzed the traffic. And uh, in fact, uh, engaged in some conversation with the people responsible for the attack. And it turned out that the Kyrgyz authorities had contracted out to a Ukrainian hacker to blast these uh, opposition newspaper websites offline during the time of demonstrations. And this is something that uh, Rafal actually coined the term just-in-time filtering, which is a great way of getting at this idea that information only has value at certain periods of time. And that it's when it values, it's, has its highest value, when it's most critical, that's when you need to bring it down, not necessarily all the time, making it inaccessible to everyone, just at certain periods of time. And I think this is really in what happened in Kyrgyzstan was a kind of window in, into what is becoming now the norm worldwide, where we're seeing these next generation controls. And I'll just run through a bunch of these. And these are the type of things that we're seeing as now defining what you might call the internet censorship uh, situation globally. So we have, for example, legal and normative measures uh, where slander and libel laws are, are being used to intimidate uh, uh, producers of content, uh, threaten them with some kind of sanction, uh, or uh, point to such laws to have uh, uh, bloggers or posters remove information, or the hosting platforms uh, undertake that action on behalf of the authorities. Uh, so it's not uncommon for the in some countries for authorities to either go directly or maybe informally through visits by security services to ISPs, to uh, social networking platforms and say, if you don't remove this, there are going to be certain consequences for you. Very similar to what we um, discussed earlier today. Um, we see uh, the Kyrgyzstan case being multiplied and duplicated in other parts of the world where it's not uncommon for uh, uh, websites at critical times to be taken down by criminal organizations or DDoS attacks that are contracted out by somebody. And this is the interesting thing, and I think why it makes it so attractive as a tool of shaping cyberspace, is that there is plausible deniability for those involved. If you contract out to a criminal organization to undertake a DDoS attack, you can say, hey, it's, it's not us, you know, there's no paper trail, uh, it's not something we're going to admit, the internet's always a problem in this country is down, it's got some technical issue, and we, of course we see this same thing going on in all of these cases right now as we speak in Iran. And that's where I think things like just-in-time uh, blocking is, is going to become more common in fact, where around elections, public demonstrations, we'll see critical sources of information being removed. Computer network attacks now are uh, becoming standard parts of many states information warfare doctrines. And uh, of course, we saw real instances of, of that being deployed in Estonia and Georgia. Um, and, and even more nefarious, I would say, is the example of patriotic hacking, where um, citizens either acting on their own or maybe encouraged by governments uh, undertake acts, undertake information attacks that, again, allow for the state to have some kind of plausible uh, deniability. And then lastly, and this is really, I think, the front where at the Citizen Lab and with our various projects and partners, we're spending most of our time right now is with targeted malware attacks and targeted surveillance. Um, of course, many of you will have heard of the, the GhostNet report. Prior to that, uh, uh, we, we had been examining many other uh, cases where this sort of thing is going on, where human rights organizations are being targeted with malware. Uh, that's more than just you know, viruses floating in the ether. These are deliberate attacks that are meant to pry inside the information of organizations who are adversarial. And again, this is becoming uh, something that is part of many states' apparatus now. And I think this is where we really need to change the kind of context for this conversation. Whereas in the past it was about 
internet censorship on the one hand, freedom of expression on the other, I think we live now in a completely different context where there is a very active cyber arms race going on. And I think that can't be underestimated. Uh, many countries around the world have now come out, whether in the last uh, year, like the Obama administration or years before that, saying, yes, this is what we want to now have as part of our arsenal, the ability to undertake computer network attacks, targeted malware attacks. Um, and these are affecting all spheres of cyberspace. You know, we have attacks on the physical infrastructure, critical infrastructures, like say what happened in Estonia or Georgia. Attacks that target the code sphere, like malware and spam and so on. Uh, this context is creating pressures in the regulatory sphere. New laws are being introduced that download a lot of policing and monitoring to internet service providers that are really changing their relationship to the network that we think of as cyberspace. And lastly, the idea sphere. And by that I mean the way in which now psycholo psychological operations are playing into uh, standard cyber warfare doctrine and what that will entail uh, for not just cyberspace, but I would say for what we're discussing here today. I think in, you could look at all spheres here in the context of cyber warfare and talk about what the impact will be on the circumvention technology projects that are discussed here. Uh, I'll just give one example. There is, under the regulatory sphere now, a very real concern with attribution and anonymity, and you hear calls for the end of anonymity online. And that sort of pressure, I think, is one example of what we'll see more of. Uh, and again, I just reiterate, this is not just a developing world phenomenon. It's something that we may have first confronted with the ONI in Kyrgyzstan, but it's something now that's happening among the great powers at the highest level uh, that is really creating a kind of culture shift uh, internationally. Now, what are the wider implications of these next generation controls? Well, first, I think, you know, speaking kind of selfishly here, I think there is a real challenge for the Open Net Initiative. We designed that project with first generation controls in mind. We built a whole methodological apparatus around the idea of monitoring and documenting and analyzing what you might call Chinese style filtering. You know, passive blocks that are programmed into routers that we can come in with our tools and identify and, and verify. Whereas the new controls that are emerging are much more subtle and flexible and, and operating just in time. And that really, I think, uh, creates a challenge for us as a monitoring organization that we're going to have to confront. I think that uh, there is a very real sense in which the, the, uh, the, the adversaries, uh, the way in which we used to think of those who are responsible for internet censorship, you know, it's the Chinese, it's the Iranians, it's the Saudi Arabians, are now uh, being replaced by a much more complex, diffuse environment. And a lot of the controls are being downloaded to private actors. And that makes, again, this whole area much more complex. When, when Facebook or Twitter or one of these platforms engages in acts that are, are essentially censorship acts, it's much more challenging to monitor, to confront and deal with than it is when it is a, a government where it's a clearly identifiable adversary, even if they're not uh, transparent about it. It's much more murky. I think that, as I said, circumvention technologies are going to be drawn into this battle, that there is a, a new geopolitical contest taking place within cyberspace that's going to affect all of the projects uh, that are assembled here. And I think that's one challenge that I would uh, put before everyone. And lastly, I think one of the things I've been advocating for, uh, for better or for worse lately, is arms control in cyberspace. And uh, without getting into the nuances of the debate there, um, I've always thought that it's important as part of an agenda to promote arms control in cyberspace, to think about promoting also a broad social movement around the idea of protecting the internet, protecting cyberspace as a forum for free expression and access to information. To me, that is one of the pillars of an arms control agenda for cyberspace. And it's in that light that I see uh, the value of the projects that are being put forward here. So I'll end it there, and thank you very much for the opportunity, and I look forward to the next couple of days. Thank you.
Yes. Well, yep, sure. The question, the question was about Australia and the proposals there for a, a national filtering system. And we've been engaged in monitoring in Australia, just like in a lot of other countries. Um, this is a proposal that's being discussed, as far as I, I know anyway. Um, but it's emblematic of the type of discussion that's happening in a lot of other advanced industrialized countries. Uh, I think the difference with Australia was a bit more extreme of a proposal than what's happening, say, in Canada. Uh, in Canada, the model is for private companies uh, have entered into a voluntary arrangement. It's not a, a law has been imposed upon them uh, where they're blocking access to a list of, of sites containing images and texts and so on of child abuse, uh, child pornography. Uh, the list of information is provided by um, a, a, a kind of civic organization, a monitoring organization, cyber tip. And, um, I guess, you know, the, the, first of all, let me say about this discussion as a whole, it's, it's always a very difficult one to enter into because right away it's, it's one of those areas of conversation where you hesitate to sound like a defender of the content in question because I think, you know, there's one case where certainly I believe this, this content is uh, objectionable, it's already illegal to circulate and produce in many countries and I think that's great. So the question is not about whether this content should be circulating or not, at least in my mind, it's about how to deal with it. And I think in the case of Canada, you have a very bad solution. In the case of Australia, it's probably even worse. Uh, in the case of Canada, private companies are undertaking this mission with the help of this cyber tip. Researchers can examine the block lists. Uh, we're not allowed to check whether there are any errors. There's no government oversight. There's no way for citizens who are concerned about whether their content's been included mistakenly in this category uh, is a problem. So to me, there are a lot of issues with this. Actually, Nart Villeneuve in the back of the room here did a chapter for access control on this topic. And Nart, I, if you, do you want to add anything to that? Is this working? Yeah. Well, I think the main problem is the tension between uh, filtering, which is sort of easy, and takedown, which is much more difficult. So what happens is, uh, there are organizations all over the world that act in the same way that CyberTip does, like the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK. They accept tips from the, from the public, and then they check to make sure that those URLs, um, well, at least I think they're URLs and hopefully not domain names or IP addresses, contain illegal content, give them to the ISPs. The ISPs block them with whatever method they choose. Um, then what happens is they don't circulate that information amongst other TIP agencies. So uh, when Canadian authorities find bad sites in the UK, we'll just block them. We don't phone them up and say, hey, we have these bad sites over there. Maybe you should do something about it. So Canada actually blocks content that's hosted in the US, despite the fact that we have uh, two law enforcement, like joint law enforcement agencies that are, target that are supposed to work on the issue of uh, images of child abuse online and a network uh, of um, operators like CyberTip that are supposed to exchange information. So someone's dropping the ball somewhere. The result is that people block a minute amount of content um, to prevent, and, and they clearly state this, to prevent accidental access to images of child abuse. So it has nothing to do with trying to get that content offline, uh, figuring out who, who's circulating that and posting that content. It's just a very kind of uh, we fill in the bullet point on our presentation to say we're doing something about this issue kind of solution. Thanks, Darren. There's uh, right there. Yep. You mentioned that uh, often the, the censoring, particularly political speech, is in the uh, local language. What do you think of the uh, capabilities for machine translation to provide the uh, Geez, that's a, that's a question for all the Google engineers here. I have no idea. Um, interesting, I suppose. I mean, uh, to me, the, the findings of the ONI's research in that area, uh, for those who didn't hear, the question is about the blocking disproportionately of local language content. Could machine translation help? And 
you know, as I said, I think it's an interesting uh, question. But for me, the, the, what we've done there, I think, is interesting to a certain extent. Uh, to me, it's, it's all of the other ways in which controls are being exercised now that are becoming much more important and, and our research doesn't really get at. And that's, that's troubling to me and a few others. And we need to really refine the way we think about doing what we do. Um, although it's still interesting as a snapshot that a lot of countries target local language content, sure. Well, sure. I mean, uh, beginning in this country, there was one of the most interesting things about the cybersecurity review was that the world's worst kept secret about information operations and computer network attacks was being openly discussed uh, for the first time. So it's not that it wasn't going on before, it's now being legitimized. I think that was a very important threshold that had been crossed. I actually was among a group of people that commented on the uh, cybersecurity announcement that Obama made, and, and that was the one thing that struck out for me. One of the things I would say that struck me was this fact. And um, once that happens, of course, it creates a, a typical uh, spiral in international relations where other countries feel compelled to follow suit and so on. And I think right now, you know, the reason that the idea of cyber arms control is, is dismissed and is so naive, for one reason anyway, is because the momentum is so much in the other direction right now. So many countries are, are seeing this as uh, uh, an area where they need to catch up, first of all, and also an area that yields very valuable information. As I said, most of our research now is in this domain of targeted surveillance, targeted espionage, malware, and so on. And looking at the type of research that's done by Greg Walton and Nart and the people who are working at the Citizen Lab on this topic, it's remarkable to me how much you can gain access to because there is such an insecure underbelly to the internet. All of these devices that are connected to it that are uh, highly insecure yet contain sensitive information that can be collected and used for whatever purposes um, I think is now such an attractive thing uh, for intelligence, for military that's creating this dynamic of an arms race. And I think it's affecting what we used to call in the past internet censorship, which we thought of, you know, at least I did all that. Well, this is something, you know, governments do. They program content into routers somewhere and you're not able to access it. Where this is, there's a whole bigger fish uh, floating out there, a uh, much bigger uh, set of problems that we need to put this in the context of, including circumvention technologies, I'd say. Well, uh, well, first, the first thing I do is I direct them to my very capable uh, people who I work with, who know more about what they'd like to get access to. So people like Nard and Greg and, and Rafal. But for me, I, I, you know, listening to that conversation this morning about uh, the data that Google has latent access to, let's say, that tells us a lot about some of these outages and blockages. To me, that would be interesting to make that data of course, open to researchers and research organizations like the Open Net Initiative would be uh, very valuable for us. And likewise, you know, in turn, we could do that with the Open Net Initiative, uh, find ways to make our data more accessible to, to organizations like, like Google. That would be one. Um, I think there are areas that many people today here, again, very capable people on the circumvention side would suggest things. I'd, I'd be interested to hear more about what that is. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you.